But first, I want to read an ekphrastic poem that was written after the assemblage dogwood meditations by Anita. Um, and uh, the piece was kind of like a grid with the assemblages. And then there were little texts or captions in each of these moments. For example, Starling Night and um, see understory myth and dogwood window. And so I tried to work those into the poem. Dogwood window. Like butterfly wings pressed, dogwood brats fan as frail and sheer as dancers skirts under glass and send me back to that frayed summer labeled misunderstood. My sorry to the man who followed you helped me across your past, a rope bridge with every seventh step missing. My dogwood window, the pink sampling planted after you said to take down the apple, our understory myth rewritten. Those crow years and their starling nights now outgrow ordinary, fly at me paper thin with frayed edges. And why has it taken me this long to touch the way I loved you, like waiting for some crumpled invitation, handful of knobby seeds? If I have lost too much of myself, raked in fall and hauled away, my leaves light commas in the wind, like the wishbone drying on the sill or the bones that once belonged to wings for home. If I have this dogwood map, my true north packed in boxes, the grief still glitters in the grass. So thank you, Anita, for your beautiful artwork. Um, so that poem was addressed to my first husband. And this next poem is to my, what I call my now husband who um, for several years would teach um, woodworking in Indiana once a year. And part of my wifely um, duties was to take him to the airport at a very early hour. Um, and so this is between life with you and a week alone. Having kissed you goodbye at 5 a.m. chased in the departures lane, I pull into home gravel under tires, swing the worn gate open wide, where breathing smells like morning from the country of my childhood, the night's damp scents nesting in the grasses, clinging to roots as light warms a trace of sage, the memory of apples or roses, those symbols. Last day of May, the iris is done, the rest of the yard, a rampant eruption, abundance of emerald and mess. Hard to know where our borders are to tell the shape of us. And this young dawn sends me back to that hillside above sharp road, wind writing its letters to the willow, to sky over the pear orchard, back to the dream of a horse knee high in pasture grass, the red seed heads bowing from living's weight. Fatigue floats me down, each gust on my skin a reminder, I am the woman who stays and longs to go. Life's as green and quick as the grass, death as certain as August that dries up the pond. When choosing poems to read tonight, um, I had one strategy. And then I was remembering something a friend said about horses showing up in my poems. And I thought, maybe I'll read horse poems tonight, or poems where horses show up. And then I received your announcement, Leopoldo, and the title of Anita's book, Why Horses? And I thought, this is going to be a really fun evening. This next poem is um, what was written when I was kind of delving into measurement and the way measurement has changed from physical artifacts to, well, they're still physical, but you can't touch them or walk on them. This is our bodies given up for light. An inch no longer measured by a thumb, a foot for walking only, old artifacts abandoned. Particle and wave 
what is the shape of essential undulations to which distance now is tethered and time? Its lambent body pummels me from the sun, glistening minutes shattered on the sand. What is the shape of love? Like a turtle pressing slowly toward the lettuce, a smooth river stone, or is it the river so often standing in for time, rushing over the rocks like the horse galloping across a field? Or is it riding the horse, the wind in her mane, in your hair, almost like flying? Is love a peach, the fur, fuzz a soft burr in your hand? Or can you not hold love, the fog that runs through your fingers? And so this book, when I was writing this collection, I was, this I should show you what it looks like. Uh, I was trying to write love poems to my husband. Love poems tend to get complicated. Uh, and I was also playing around with art and the idea of art and my frustrations of not being an artist. And I had some self-portraits and some kind of collage-ish poems and a couple of diptychs and some sketches, like sketch for blue or yellow or red. And this next poem is Sketch in Green Grown Close. And the little fun trivia fact is that the first two lines of this poem were actually originally for a completely different poem. And there was no way I could wedge them into that poem. So I had to throw them out, and, but then they came back here. Sketch in Green Grown Close. Any green grass can hold a horse, but only a crow grazes on the parking strip the garden this year fending for itself, the rambling roses flood of thorns, the sage not naivete or cash or envy sneaking emerald in the weeds, not the theater's green room where I ate green grapes before the show, costume of my August gasping across the Hudson from New York, old oaks and maples choked with leaves, held the heat close before we moved west between these laurels, walls shoving toward the sun, hedges I dread to trim, but you climb the ladder I'm grabbing as counterbalance, confetti falling green around me, scents of honey, vanilla, then the rake and broom until done, clutching our green, a road trip to our salad days, a bottle of wine from Susa, the green light that paints the dusk's edges before night falls completely. And now I'd like to read some, some newer work, which is fun. Um, this, this first poem mentions Versailles and the Boboli Gardens, which are in Florence. You and the grasses I love. On my knees, I am pulling long grasses, ripping out the roots of weeds, what goes to seed, the rampages of thoughts blooming, feathery clouds among the irises and bees. I am yanking the grasses that make my city yard wild. Time was any uncut patch of lawn lush or dying looked like the country, a field I cut across, pausing halfway, pretending down to the clover, a pasture and the horse. The wind wickered and I asked again for an acre or so, a little wild place to walk, to stop and sit. I have been smitten with Boboli and Versailles, their vistas and parterres, immaculate angles and rounds we wandered, but I lost the book where I sketched those beds. Here, in the middle of my middle age, I desire meadow under my feet, orchard through my window, and if my body is the garden I've let go to seed, may I tend it so gently that spaces open up for watching the weather, for sunrise, snow, and finches, yes, for a brook, the grasses climbing tall in all their varieties, and in there, we could dwell, not needing the names of things. So for this next poem, I have, I have something for you. 
um, it's a prompt that you can use. And um, what happened is I wanted to write another horse poem and I wanted to write about Palomino. And I had no idea what I was going to say about Palomino or why I wanted to write about Palomino. So at the top of my notebook page, I wrote down, why write about Palomino? And just started answering it in fragments and went until I ran out of steam and then started again. So it's kind of fun. I welcome you to try it. And here is the poem, the first poem with that prompt, Palomino. Name sounding like a song from another country. Name from Spanish for little dove. I was little with a large hunger, hunger for space and wind. A horse, the color of morning. A morning, the song of starting fresh. Hoof prints in the dust, all the shades of gold. Little girl with a dream of gold running Little bird dream of flight, dream galloping, space and wind, the smell of saddle leather. A road somewhere, road with my name on it invisibly. When could I take the bit in my teeth? Palomino, because sorrel sounds like sorrow. My best days trying to ride on from that. And a few months later or a year or whenever, um, I decided, or actually a friend mentioned to me that it might be good to have another poem to balance that one out. So I didn't wanna write the same poem again and I couldn't write the same poem again, but I tried the prompt again and came up with this poem, which is titled Chestnut. At camp, I looped the leather strap through the cinch three times, tight enough. Buckskin, pinto, piebald, roan, chestnut. From the time I could talk, I wanted to move to the country where the horses lived. I wanted a horse, an old story. In fall, I gathered horse chestnuts, polished to a shiny bay, poisonous to eat. Anything horse, horse shoes, horsing around, horsehair chairs in novels, my violin bow, tail and mane and mane and mane. Time I tried to swing myself up bareback until I could, the horse, a chestnut, waited. Pastern, fetlock, withers, flank. Barns that have slumped gray to the ground, weathered into dirt. Another way to see aging under summer blue. Blue as in sky, as in moon, as in mood. A way to see blue as a day I graze through. Horse as in freedom, fenced. Horse as in agreement, I, I, I feed you for this. What does it mean now to saddle, to ride? Horse as wind for the dream I've tried to bridle. The horses stay beautiful, the blue wild and yonder. And that brings me to my final poem, um, which uh, was written on the assignment to write a prayer or entreaty. And I went right for the horse. So here we go. This is On the Verge. The horse in me thunders up to the edge, slides to a stop, shies away. If in my field I sidle, if I doze and shift my weight to my other leg, when the horse in me gets the itch, the urge to race, all twitch and quiver, shoulder to flank, hip to hoof, snort and sweat and storm, this time run me hard, Help me gallop through the heat haze and summer dust. This time, when I reach the brink that could be cliff or threshold, help me face where it leads to find the living there and feel what might shimmer, what might heal. Thank you, everyone. Here. So this is my book, um, Why Horses, and um, not all the poems in there are about horses, uh, but there are some, a lot of them. 
uh, the book is in three parts. So um, the first, um, and they're named after poems in the book. Like the first part is called Landscape of the Moment. But I'm gonna start off with a poem called Gratitude. And it's basically for, um, well, it's about gratitude. Here I am away from home in the company of women. The ocean is at a loss for horizon, but always comes forward at the shoreline. And we are in the company of women. The assertion of waves washes the sand, then relaxes, laying it down and taking it back to the heart. In the company of women, glass floats in sand dollars, wet with wave and rain, remain together after the tide moves off. White froth turns amber and thick, like the language of gratitude. And here we are, just a small gathering of women, writing under the gray clouds, tiny birds sing in the distance. And that was written at a writing retreat, so um, uh, on the peninsula. And this one, next one was written at, on Orcas Island, it's called Neap Tide Rising. The generosity of ocean waves delivers tidal gifts to world travelers. Little white hats on the horizon draw nearer and nearer. Shorebirds gather together in the darkening dusk, then disperse in the morning's weather. Seagulls sail the drafts and dip into the tips of waves. Large logs prefer to travel alone in the storm unless they hang together as a solid and dubious mass, a danger to dodge. The cormorant, goldeneye and merganser work the winter waves, a duty involving the cold dimness of the depths and also joy. A seal's head rides the surface, blinks at the wind and thirsts for evergreen dew. When it dives under, it never returns. Otter tails rise up too, and then plunder under the crest of the great sea gray table. The wistful voices of the dead wash ashore in the storms, an eternal chorale singing the holy tones of stones. The eagle sings with the awe of little girls, that high and gleeful pitch, while the sea watches her children, she dreams of her own lost mother. So the next poem is um, arguing with Rumi. There's an epigraph <clears throat> that from Rumi that says, um, "When you do things, when you do things from your soul, you feel a river moving in you, a joy." Um, arguing with Rumi. The soul is a heavy river, a wide and muddy river, a thick river filled by the mountains and the drainage of cities and the little drizzles, not joy, not happiness, but the soul working and working with elation and deep sorrow becoming its own truth. And another poem in this section is called Freeze Frame. It's just about a little ant. Um, Freeze frame. In warm weather, stunted black ants march briskly across the slab table under the cottonwoods. If I set my if I set my journal down or even a pen anywhere near one, it will halt, become immobile, a minuscule pismire who freezes in place. Sometimes for over a minute it will stand stock still like the tiniest statue in the world. I thought it dead and prepared to flick it off when abruptly the thing starts up again, as if it had just come to, suddenly remembered the kettle left on the burner or heard someone yell, green light. And off it goes again, the mechanical ant, as though nothing. So, um, and then this, let's see. This is the next four poems are from the second part of this book, and um, 
which is titled the day after a letter sorry letter for the day after tomorrow and this one is called the green pear this poem on the sunlit on the sunlit sill a green pear begins to blush it's been ripening for days forever the pear was picked too soon for fear it would turn to mush but in fact the meat is hard as stone Wrapped in paper and tucked into darkness, the cruelty of a sour pear sweetens in time. But this is a waste of beauty. The pear tree grows in the foothills where cool rains wash the orchards clean. The grove is like a close-knit family and follows the valley as does a river. There, the air opens to the sound of flickers calling a fitful knock on wood. Sunlight sugars the pear, a ladle of luster. I wrote, I, can't, I keep bees now, and so every once in a while I write something about the bees. But this poem here is about, um, not about honeybees, but another kind. Um, it's called What the Buzz is All About. A bumblebee flies low across the duff like a harrier the hawk who looks for dinner in the mulch. Low and lower she goes. This is not about sweetness, not about the waxen, nor the repetition of hexagonal perfection. The blundering bee is an aircraft aiming for a flower, making a flyover too risky to compensate for error, her landing gear always down and at the ready. There are laws out there to follow if one wishes to fly. How many wing bit beats per second? How many, sorry, how many wing beats per second? How wide the wing, how round the fluffy, how, how round and fluffy must be the body to achieve the ultimate flight. Do not forget the weight capacity of wing load. Remember the precise amplitude of buzz to waver over the laden blossoms. This fuzzy bee's motto has always been the humbler the bumble, the bumbler the bundle. She knows you know exactly what she means. Let's see. Um, this one here is called uh, Early One Morning. Early One Morning. It's not always easy getting up to squint all day toward the sunset's fireball. This time of year, even the mossy footpaths have dried to dirt and blow harmless tornado bouquets. The scent of alder mixes with the sweat of the horse who is running uphill toward the forest vistas. She churns her hooves as if every step might be her last. Not like you think but like every step is her first too. Like this is the day that will be the most important of her life. Like she's taking you along just for the ride. Um, and then I was, when Jim was featured here about a month ago, he read with John Gorski and um, he read a poem about uh, food that he really didn't care for when he was growing up. And um, I, I have a, Poem that I like to share for that with that same sort of theme. It's called um, What Tasted Bad Then and Still Does Today. Liver, lima beans, canned peas, canned green beans, canned corn, canned spinach, kidneys, bread pudding, breaded meatloaf, hash browns using half bread, half potatoes, canned raviolis, canned tomato soup, the tongue swell of Krusty's pancake mix, Miracle Whip, American cheese, pickles, especially sweet, squash, yams, and sweet potatoes when cooked with brown sugar, aspic with green olives and pimento, any berry except the huckle on a hike. See, there isn't all that much. Most can go down quick as a pill with a big gulp of milk. Kidneys and liver make nice little treats for the dog, the cat, the vacuum cleaner. A paper napkin wadded just so can disguise 
ball of canned anything. A small handful of whatever's left can find its way down the white gullets of a toilet. A word for the brave child. Hold tight with all your might. Eat like a monster, growling and glaring. A word for the miserable child. Stare and stare at your so-called food. Suddenly it will become a foreign landscape for you alone to explore. May this be your first lesson in artistry. A word to the stubborn child. If all else fails, sit there weeping quietly for hours until everyone else falls asleep. Remember, there isn't much you don't like. Never forget. <laughs> That one may be thirsty for some reason. Um, the third part of this book is called The Importance of Average Miracles. And I'm going to start with a um, one of my harder poems to read, but I'm going to do that one anyway. It's called Questioning, Questioning the Immortality of Horses. After seeing how she went down, how she squeezed her eyes shut, how she lay there breathing hard under a hot and ignorant sun, how her nostril, nostrils flared, how her teeth showed between her lips, how she labored to get up, though her legs would buckle and she would topple and the dust would rise. After running to get her halter, after her nose lifted to receive it, after experiencing the relief of the fastened clasp, then following her efforts to rise, after straining to heft this weight from the dirt and accepting the scorch of the rope on the palm, after seeing her strength surrender, after feeling her drop, the force of her, after staring into the stupid sun, after attempting to give her some shade, after the gesture of feeding her a small carrot, her eye open and round as her lips reached for it, after 45 minutes when she rose again, after thinking about the alternatives, about what if she didn't get up, and then about what would happen if she collapsed in her stall or slipped in the mud, if she went down in the woods, if she went down beyond the pond, if she went down in the pond, after struggling with preserving the spirit of life, the simple worthiness of it, after laboring with the idea of pain, after speculation about existence and the ancient, after contemplating history and our future and the duration of all of it, after seeing her down with her eyes wincing, the question persists. So I've had several types of pets and things, including horses, but the dogs and things. And here's a poem titled, Instead of a Dog. Instead of a dog, when, when I was small, we had a chicken named Midnight, a feisty black bantam. Her sister, Moonlight, was stolen by a thieving dog under a hot sun before their first summer was through. If we could find them, Midnight gave us tiny eggs with buttery orange yolks, good enough to fight over. We entertained the bored neighborhood kids with her chicken tricks. She'd swing on anyone's leg who'd stick one out, then expect to ride it like a swing or else peck at the legs she sat on. Our chicken was tough enough to fight with any shoelace put in front of her. She'd rip its eyes out, had a hunger for violence that satisfied the fat bully on a, of our block. Midnight was a faith, was, mid, midnight was dog faithful, a malicious jouster, a secret relative from the old world. She followed us around like a disciple. If you looked carefully into her eye, you'd see the descendant of a prehistoric bird of prey. When we were lucky enough to get ice cream, she'd rest on an arm like a trained hawk to get her share. 
We were so young, we didn't know the difference between surprise and generosity when her beak dove deep into the cone. Our education in ethics came from a chicken with a head on straight, a little black hen with ice cream on her beak. Uh, okay, I have two more poems. Um, this one is um, another one from how I grew up. Um, last year's Lost and Found. On a day so hot, our boredom sizzled and popped. A day so sunny, our souls were blind by purity. Three brothers and I stood before our empty elementary school, daring each other to go in there. It was summertime and the doors were locked. The doors were also chained together like prisoners. The lowest glass in the entry door was already shattered, pieces glittering like jewels on the black mat inside. Skinny little kids. We shoved ourselves through the serrated window, across the crystalline shards and into the stuffy hallways of our abandoned school. A dim glow shone through the windows of the shut classroom doors, a kind of secondhand light. The bell of white noise clanged in our ears as we tiptoed down the hall. We checked each room, each classroom door, locked, tried the restrooms open, woohoo, but beyond the, but beyond dark, and who knew who might be in there? We snuck past the principal's office and were delighted to notice the lost and found bin still on the floor, filled to the brim and overflowing. This was the treasure of the dropped, the abandoned, and the long forgotten. And it was open for grabs, grubby winter coats, gloves paired and not paired, a new saddle shoe, black and white, my favorite, but oh man, just the one. We weren't even to the bottom yet. We found yo-yos, a baseball bat, peppermints even, and then a small box filled with loot, bracelets, rings, necklaces, earrings, a booty of plastic, glass, and metal. A golden bracelet dangled, huge pearls, spiky shells, starfish. That's the thing I grabbed as we heard footsteps echoing off the far end of the hall. My brother's fingers, too, were suddenly full of plunder, and we ran quick and quiet as rodents, like vermin, down the dark hall and out. The footsteps rushing toward us became our own, racing toward home. And then I have uh, one more poem. It's a short one. Uh, this one is basically dedicated to Jim um, hmm. Bertolino. Um, it's called My Life. Your slippers are paired beside the dresser. They're woolly inside, but old as my horse. Duct tape holds them together like you've done these past years for my heart. Thank you. Um, I just have one one poem tonight, which uh, is one of the COVID poems of the last year, although it felt like it was more appropriate tonight than it's probably ever been before. And it's called Climate Change. Bred to be racist, swaddled and white, nourished on milk from anxious breasts. I left home not knowing I wore contact lenses, believed I was 100% truthful when I swore I saw no difference between myself and the occasional black girls I met. How then to explain the visceral cringe when a black man walked toward me? I've worked to remove that cringe, rooted out stem and leaf, but it wants to grow back in this nourishing American soil. Words matter versus words matter. Knee 
redefined as noose. It's not a new thing and it's deadly efficient, doesn't require a tree and a rope. It only takes hate, hate and swagger and a little pressure on the back from the rest of the guys. For them, was it like the frisson I felt when I stepped on that snail in the garden, saving my vegetables and flowers? I've learned to act otherwise. Can the cops? Thanks. Thank you. That was a good poem, Sylvia. And the, the features were wonderful. Thank you. In the beginning, Lot's wife died nameless, not because she looked back, but for remembering. In a sweet vision, I live naked, small trees wide spaced, warm shade rich with apricots, a white beach in view, gentle surf, a dark squall rushing across the water a walled colossus to the south, massive piers, men of all shades at labor, oars and sails, slanted ships, long and low, bilge and shackles, Babel, the towers at city center in flames, smoke and harbor stench, billowing silver in the sun, I have always longed to live simply in an orchard, figs and cedar, olives and almonds, ladders and baskets, gloves and fresh bread, each day time stretching to the evening cool. So many remember their past lives as princes, like them, I long for Eden, where tyranny and forgetting were new. Uh, I'm going to read a brief poem that has, it's about the sea and that kind of goes back to the two featured poets tonight, Joni and Anita. So there's the sea element here. The man came out of the sea and stood on the edge of life. He made a step. The wave washed away all traces of its existence. Shouted, noise drowned out his voice. He raised his eyes to the sun. Sun drowned in the sea. The man came out of the sea and stood on the edge of life. Thank you. Okay. This is entitled, There Should Be No End, and it begins with a quote by Yehuda Halevi. Tis a fearful thing to love what death can touch. Yehuda Halevi. There should be no end to tears, you said, offering the whole box of tissue to the new widow who wanted an end to hers. There should be no end to laughter, I said. We should dance until the song ends, linger just a moment longer in the embrace, steal an extra moment when no one's looking. I will turn to you for the full arc of your bloom, hold your hand while it stills from death, hold on a little longer to accept the full gift of grief your warm-hearted essence cooled by shifting breeze technicolor memories losing their chlorophyll curling and drying until they drop piling up as late falls leaves after a windstorm a new vow you can count on me to make a mess of this pile a ruin of careful planning and just so to feel my big feet small in your chunky rubber boots, to jump in, stamp around, sing amidst the whoosh and cracking, 
kick memories this way and that, dance in the leaf-tossed air, fall back in the moist, musty bed, laugh at the sight I must make, a grown woman playing in dead leaves, who no longer has to come in before dark, who can cry as long as it takes until no longer afraid to live in the world you have left. Thank you. Wow, very strong, wow. This poem is called Folly. Right. Desiderius Erasmus wrote in Latin in praise of folly 500 years ago. The church providing folly gratis. Stone the blasphemer was not the hue and cry. Erasmus, who faced it with excuses that everyone was foolish, sometimes less, sometimes more. Well, where he spelled more with uh, M-O-R-E. Besides, it was in Latin. Only studious schoolboys had grown up enjoying it. For these, the fun was on everyone. Now, all is in English. Everyone reads, few understand. Folly is everywhere. There is no reprieve. And, uh, so. <laughs> Okay, a little bit of uh, background. You, you know, uh, you have Desiderius Erasmus wrote about folly, and he dedicated the book to Sir Thomas More, who was the Chancellor of England. So he, so he, uh, he said in his preface that if anybody found fault with the poem, uh, with the book, they could blame it on uh, <coughs> Sir Thomas. Okay, so he got out of that. That uh, so. That's a note for this one. Good to be back. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read a couple of poems from uh, uh, an older book of mine. I just put my hand on it today, and I, I really like the cover. Um, and um, it uh, goes way back to, well, it was published by a small press in Cincinnati called Cherry Grove Collections. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Um, here are my two poems. Smudged window. Pets died. Lucrative positions dried up. Those who profess love sent their vouchers and now he's back. Like a smudged window cleared with a forearm, the light breaking in makes the chill bourbon a chalice of trembling. He does not pause for the mewling in the alleyway does not pause, does not pause to praise the bus arriving on time. Those do not matter because he is owned by a force unknown and finds himself happy. And then here's a short poem called Like a Toy. Life seems dimmed by wants unsatisfied. No wonder Buddha said desire is the source of pain. But like a toy that breaks into song when a rough cord is drawn through it, we do find music in what a braids. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Good to good to be back. And uh, I have two poems for you. One short one called "At the South At the South End of Lake Wacom. At night, the lake looks closer, and somehow it's brighter than the sky. 
spread out like watery cloth. It's hard to think of the speed of light or the way light's supposed to bend around things. From where I stand by the still water, the stars don't pulsate. They get bigger and bigger, wet as the grass at our feet. And the next one is called To the Muse, and it was written after seeing an assemblage by Anita, Anita Boyle. To the Muse. Yes, we have wasp nests, snail shells, gaskets, pond scum, circuit boards, and capacitors. When the moon starts going to funerals, reading obits for the ones whose burial this insensate entity might wish to see, Still, we have blue wire, a level. Maybe we're enablers and we want to heal certain mute lacquered rooms. Would it be therapeutic if we breathed? Perhaps we can say it even if it's mawkish, like a story of two siblings who haven't seen each other ostensibly in 70 years till they get together on the airwaves when Delilah, the DJ and soul seamstress plays them a song you are the wind beneath my wings. It's sappy, yes, but as you say, it doesn't have to be. It depends on how you handle things. Okay, we have smudged handmade paper, graphite, dragonfly nymphs, rusty nails, lights across the water, and maybe someone touches your wrist and asks, Yoo-hoo, don't you know it was me left that blue plastic star scotch tape to the neck? of your guitar. All right. Uh, last week I read a poem about um, Krista Casey, who was a mentally ill poet. I mean, more so than a lot of us anyhow. Uh, but she was a, a, very, a very good uh, poet, you know, and you could find her, uh, you know, you could Google her on, on your computer if you, I want to read some of her poems, but she was a friend of mine about the last 10 or 11 years she was alive and she died in 2008. And so about the last year she was alive, I wrote a lot of poems, probably maybe half a dozen poems about her. So this is one of them, just entitled Krista. Riding the five down the graphite tones of Third Avenue asphalt under an evening of Belltown overcast, I think of Krista blocks away working on a poem or reading the owl in the mask of a dreamer, songs pouring incessantly from her computer, her balsam colored fedora with black hat band crowns a high ledge of books, a crowd of boots and shoes spill from a closet onto the floor, varmint, her domestic short hair, meows at her feet to be taken into her lap and petted. I see Krista there in her room in a chiascuro of air, gray with smoke from her cigarette. She rests in a ragged secondhand chair, listening to my troubles. Her face, a herald marrow of malevolent, of malevolent phrases broadcasting through her mind. Amid the pale walls of her room at the VA hospital, she hands me a photo album of her and friends as teenagers camping on beaches south of San Francisco under faded blue Kodak skies. She is happy then in a maroon and beige polo shirt, chestnut hair hanging past her shoulders, her face alabaster and unclouded before the voices stole her smile. Thank you. Yeah. And I felt like reading a sad poem. So um, this, I'll dedicate this to siblings of George Floyd. The Lost Brother. I began to see you everywhere. In a movie, you were the spy swapping one briefcase for another. You got off buses just as I found my seat. I often caught a glimpse of you in crowds once at a 4th of July fireworks, another time late one night in Galway, when I wear the blue sweater I bought there, I think of you. I've never mourned for you the way I've mourned others, and maybe that's why. I was glad you'd escaped your busted marriage, left behind your bad choices, 
like a trail of crumbs to be eaten by birds. I've dreamed you living in a mountain cabin, reading Dostoevsky and writing poems. I'm not cracked. I know we left you on that hillside, your coffin turned away from the marker because our mother didn't want your head down and feet up for all eternity. Even that secret animates you as if you might dust off your hands with a that's that and step back into your life. Our lives survive our deaths that much you've taught me. Even extinguished, a life reverberates, expanding like sound waves from an explosion. Our common ground was a raft of ice. With you gone, it breaks smaller and smaller. Am I tired after all these years of carrying you with me? I'm not. You weigh nothing like a hole in my pocket. I never forget you're not here. Thank you. Want to say how much? This one I wrote, I'd like to share two short ones, very short ones. Um, this one is called Vipassana Meditation by a Zoom. Still working on it. So I'm gonna share it because I am still working on it. Something opened last spring in us amid our collective thoughts on nothing. We muted choir of breezes from neighborhoods across the nation, coaxing the peace doves wingtip feathers to turn to face a note, mid-flight, a pantomime of song, letting go, letting it fly. And then this one's even shorter. It's untitled. Snow on the wind loom, tendrils weave its own design. Thank you. Mm -hmm.